We have been looking on the book, on the book, right, wow, on the book. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm sleepy. Book of Judges, chapter 16, we have been looking to the story of Samson. And, you know, I've been telling you a little bit about Samson. He was kind of like the hero of its time, right? He was probably in all the witty box, boxes, you know, cornflakes and Cheerios and all that. He was probably right there. He was the man. Little boys were probably had shorts or boxers with Samson face in there, little Samsons, right? And, you know, if we look to our time, you might identify him probably looking something like that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe something like Rambo, perhaps. What's up, bro? You got it. Great way to go. Maybe something like that, like Rambo, you know, long hair, strong. Or maybe, I don't know, the Huntsman, something kind of like girls, something like that, maybe. Or Conan, the Barbarian. For those of you who didn't know him before, that was... You're killing me, bro. Conan, Arnold, ex-governor of California. But truly, I've been looking pictures all around, and this is my favorite. I think he, Samson was something like that. Some, that Samson right there. If you ask me, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But all right, so let's dig in to the story itself. Judges 16. And we know Samson, right? We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> but Samson is like, you know, the strong guy. He is the savior of Israel. Israel was in the midst of war. There was always uh, a foreign country trying to attack them. So God gave the people of Israel a big fighter, right? Like that was going to be their, their leader, their, his, their captain. So he named Samson. And he gives Samson a special gift, which was supernatural strength. But along with that strength, God gives Samson three responsibilities. First of all, he should never cut his hair, therefore the long hair. Second, he should never get drunk. He shouldn't be tasting alcohol. And thirdly, he shouldn't touch anything dead. So there were three things that Samson needed to do, all right? And if he did that, that was basically a proof that he was taking care of God's law for him personally. So he was taking care of that relationship with God. But as we see in the story, Samson had a weakness. And you all know that weakness by now, right? Samson had a thing for the ladies. That was his weakness. So... We read along that at some point, Samson fell in love with a girl from the valley named Delilah, right? And the leaders of the enemies of Israel come to her and they tell her, like, hey, we know that Samson is after you. Like, he likes you. So we have something for you. If you get the secret... Of his strength, we'll hook you up. We'll show you the money. And according to current studies, it showed that she was probably going to get from this people between 12 to 15 million dollars. So that was pretty good. Just for tricking a guy, get what was the strength, what was the secret, and reveal it so they can get him. So let's go back to the story, verse 16. Let's read along. It says, And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him. First week we saw the meaning of those words. And basically we're going through the six stages that will get us into sexual sin. So these are very six words that we have to be very careful. Because you don't just fall into sexual sin just like that. There are stages in your life that you're being careless and careless until you actually go all the way. So first week we learned that there's this enticement, then this pestering thing. So it says that she pestered him and pressed him so that his soul was 
vexed to death. His soul was emptied. We saw that last week. So he told her all of his heart and say to her, this is the truth. No racer has ever come up on my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Samson finally, after a few weeks or a few days of, you know, playing with her, you know, having this little, little game going on, he finally gives in. He finally reveals the secret of his heart. And verse 18 says, When Delilah saw that he had told her all of his heart, that means the truth, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up, on, come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money. That was her goal, the money. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees. I want you to mark that word, lulled. All right? If you look into the modern English, that is to numb, to, to make you sleep. So he gets, she gets him to fall asleep on her knees and call for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. She finally got what she wanted. After a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, he finally gives in. And he reveals the secret of his strength. And he thought that it was going to be okay. But this tells you one thing. You have to be careful who you open your heart to. Because not everybody is there to take care of you. There's people in this world like Delilah. That she's after one thing. And that is to destroy you. Because they just want one thing from you. And then they'll toss you away. So be careful who you open your heart to. Right now, let's move forward. We'll come back to the story. All right? Don't forget about word. Lulled. Sleeping. But let's move forward to Romans 13, 11 and 12. We'll start there. And it says... This is Paul. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than, we, than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly. As in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Next line, so important. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So it is up to you. It's up to you. To feed the lust in you, to feed the flesh, your desires, or to put Jesus, like the Bible says. <clears throat> so, let me tell you something about sleeping. I don't know if you have ever been in a car with the driver taking a nap. Just imagine that. That sucks right there. And I remember one time. Uh, I was with four friends in a car driving from Moncloa to Monterrey. We went to Moncloa, we played at a church, and then we were heading back. And it was really late, and it's like three, four hours driving. And it was like late, like 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. And one of my friends, the one driving, I won't say his name, but he knows who that is. <laughs> and... We were just chilling, right? Everybody was talking, and he was just like, I guess, we thought he was paying attention, like being, you know, listening to us. 
We're like, oh, yeah, this, this, and that. And we were close to Monterrey, like all, all, already there. And all of a sudden, he goes like, oh, my God, I fell asleep. And we're like, what? Yeah, man, I was asleep. For how long? I don't know. Like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, that guy was taking a nap for who knows how long. I'm like, dude, you're crazy. You're going to kill us. No, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay. Like, man, I don't know if it was for two seconds or for two minutes or what. So that was one time. But then, on a different occasion, we were playing in a camp, you know, a youth camp. And it was really, really late. It always gets late with us for some reason. It was like 2, 3 in the morning, and we're coming from our camp, Sierra Linda, over there in Monterrey. And we're heading back to the city, right? And it was like, again, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. And he drove down from the hill because it's, this is in the forest. So he drops down all the way to the highway. And he tells me, this time he tells me, hey, how are you feeling, Leo? And I'm, I'm pretty cool. Like, you want to drive? Like, sure, I, I can drive. He was, the, like, he was that tired. He never lets me drive his car. Never. And he's like, oh, I take the keys. And he pulled over. We switched places. So I'm driving. And again, it's like me, that guy is in the co-pilot seat, taking a nap, and two guys on the back seat. And we're talking, and we're just, you know, having fun, whatever, driving at night in the middle of the road. And all of a sudden, like, I'm driving right in this curve, and he wakes up. And he's used to drive all the time, right? So he thought he was driving. It was hilarious. He wakes up, and he's like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And he tries to swing and try to catch the wheel. I'm like, dude, what's wrong with you? And he just looks at me driving, and he's like, Oh, man, you're driving. Yeah, dude, I'm driving. And he was just, it was hilarious. He thought that he was still driving and he fell asleep driving. So it's amazing how, like, I mean, you're driving. And, you know, a car is a dead machine. I mean, you have a monster of steel. Sometimes now just plastic, but still. It has a lot, a lot of steel, right? And it's a car. And, I mean, you can kill somebody with that car, right? You can kill yourself. But still, I don't know what happens. Instead of being sharp in a way, like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm driving. I don't know. Somehow our, our mind just like, no, cool, bro. You can relax. I got this. But you go autopilot, right? And sometimes people fall asleep. Why? Have no clue. But that same thing happens to us spiritually. Like, you think you're doing fine. You think you got this. You know, man, I know. I know God. I love God. I love Jesus. I love my people in my church. I'm not going to sin, man. I got this. But we get comfortable. You know, we get too familiar with our church, too familiar with our situation. And, and we can, too, fall asleep. We can get numb. We can get lulled like Samson. It can happen. It's so easy. Because, man, you're used to driving, right? I got this, man. I know this road. I have drive this place a thousand times. I can do it with my eyes closed. And we can do that with our spiritual lives. Like, man, I know. I know I have to read the Bible. I know God. I already know the Bible. Look, I know the Bible. I'm not going to read it for the next year. I got this. And we get, you know, too confident, too cocky. And we start, we stop taking care of the thing God has commanded us. And go with me with 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says, now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith. And you have seen this. You know people that used to come that are not here anymore. And it's not just because they went to a different church. They just stopped going to church. So it says, you know, people will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Seared. Like, you know, have you ever burned yourself? And you no longer feel anything right there because that's it. I mean, it's seared. You have no more feeling in that area, no sensi sensitivity. 
And that happens with us. We, we move away from God and his people and his church. And we move away from the Bible. And we move away from everything that God loves. And we start sinning. And we start to getting ourselves into this environment, into these activities that you know you shouldn't be part of. But you're like, it's okay, it's just one time. And then again, oh, it's just one time. I never do this. You know, just once more. I just want to try it. And it happens that you too can have your conscience here. And you have no more. At the beginning, you do feel bad. Like you do something that is wrong. Like, oh, man, I know I shouldn't have done that. And, and you still have that, that sense of guilt, right? You're like, oh, man. But then you do it again, and you can kind of still feel guilty about it, but not that much. And, uh, and you keep going and going, and you feel less and less God's presence. And you feel less and less remorse and less and less guilt until it's gone. You are in the middle of the worst of the worst. You just dive into the filth, into the sinning world, and you don't even feel bad anymore. It can happen. That danger is there. And, and that's not what God meant for us. Like in our lives, again, Jesus is bringing sexy back. And we're talking about sexually, sexual purity. That's, we're trying to look at what it is that God wants for you. Not what the culture says. Not what the world says. Not what MTV says. What God says for you and your sexuality. God gave you that sexuality, but with a purpose, with a time, with a clock. And we're going to read in Genesis what God meant for you. It says in Genesis 2, we're back to Adam and Eve. We started with Samson, right? We're going back to Adam and Eve, to the moment of creation. Genesis 2, 21 says, And the Lord God... Cause a deep sleep to fall on Adam. So Adam, you know, he wasn't day by day naming the animals and all that. And then, oh, I'm tired. Oh, boom. <laughs> he, he goes into a big sleep, right? Induced by God. And he slept. And then it says, and he, that is God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its, in, in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made it into a woman, to a woman. And he brought her to the man. So when God was creating the woman, what was going on with Adam? He was sleeping, right? He was in peace. And in the meantime, God created the woman. What for? For him, right? God created the woman for him. But while he was creating the woman, Adam, he was asleep. And when the woman was ready, he takes the woman back to Adam, and then he wakes Adam up. And what was the first thing Adam saw? Whoa, man. And, you're like, and I'm pretty sure you're like, whoa, nice. Good job, God. Good job. But before that, he was asleep. Now, the King Solomon, everybody knows Solomon, the king, right? The wisest man ever. He has a book, Songs of Solomon. And the whole book is about sex, sexuality, romance. And he has a lot to say about the subject. And Songs of Solomon 2.7 says the following. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Very important warning. Do not stir up nor awaken love. Until it's time. 
What happens in our culture, guys? Our culture is stirring you up. It's trying to awake you before time. And it's trying to get you into this sexual activity before it's time. And here, clearly, the Bible says, do not stir it up, nor awaken love until it's time. Why? Because if you do, you're just going to get hurt, man. Girls, you're just going to get hurt. Do not awaken love. Wait. Like Adam, go to sleep. And when your mate is ready, when your couple is ready, then wake up. Then wake up. Not before. Don't wake up before. Because you're going to mess it up. You're going to screw things up. Wait for God's time. And it's going to be amazing. But not before. Don't do it before. And honestly, you might be thinking, ah, this is cute. You know, the sex talk in church, right? It's, it's, it's way more than that, guys. It's way more than that. I have seen hundreds of lives broken because they awoke love before it was time. They started engaging in this whole sexual game before the right time. And I can tell you, 100 times out of 100, it doesn't end up right. It doesn't. I can tell you that. And, and it's not just about getting pregnant. That's just one of many consequences. But it's not just about that. I can tell you a case that after engaging in sexual activity, this girl, she felt so messed up. She felt so used that after one point it was like, what's the point now? Why should I take care of myself anymore? And this person just went all crazy into things that you don't even want to know. Why? Because at one point she was like, I'm used goods. No one is going to love me anymore. I'm not, I'm not good for that. So who cares? Just let me get lost in that. And it's not a happy road, I'm telling you. It's not a happy road. Again, it's not about getting pregnant and everybody to know and Oh, the shame. That's just one bit consequence in many consequences. I want to talk to you. A little bit about sex trafficking. Man, you think about sex trafficking and you might be thinking, oh yeah, that must happening in Africa or I don't know, South America or I don't know, Europe maybe. You know, Europeans are crazy. But not here, not in Texas. Well, I hope you get a wake up call. I'm going to read you a, a, a few things about sex trafficking here in Texas. Texas is considered the epicenter of human trafficking in the United States. Like, if you thought that California was wild, New York, Miami, no, Texas is considered the epicenter of human trafficking in the United States. That's shocking. When I read this, I was like, wow, no way. It says the I-10 corridor is the most heavily traveled through, through fair for traffickers and victims of international human trafficking. Nationwide, a quarter of rescue victims are rescued in Texas. Well, that's good. It's a good thing to consider. But that, that's because there's so much here. An estimate one of every three runaway children is lured into sex slavery within 48 hours of leaving home. That's, that's scary, man. And you know, there's a lot of people trying to get away from home. Children, teenagers who think they can do whatever they want. Man, I'm 15, but I'm sick of mom and dad. I'm going to go. You have heard that. I have heard that among people of your age. Well, one of every three of those who think that they can do it on their own, that they want to go away, they end up slaves of sex trafficking. 
That's scary, guys. The average age of entry into domestic, that's in the United States, sex trafficking is between 12 and 13 years old. How about that? How about that? 12, 13-year-old boys and girls trapped into the sex trafficking world. Here, Texas, U.S. Man, people from your age for some of you. So this is not just about, oh, yeah, we're going to have the birds and the bees and the flower talk in church. It's not about that, man. It's way bigger than that. And, and every time someone goes and clicks to one of those porn websites, man, you're just feeding the industry. You're just helping to get more people slaved. Like, no, man, I will never trade any of those people. No, I will never participate in those things. Every time you just open that website when nobody's watching you, you're giving them power. You're participating in all that. So it's about that. It's about much more. It's about take care of your body. Take care of your soul. Because, man, there is a world up, out there that's trying to get you numb. They're just trying to lure you and, and, and trick you and seduce you into, yeah, man, it's all good. Look, it's flashy, sparkling. It's just a deadly bait, man. When all your friends are just going wild and you, and you hear about these parties, man, it's not going to end up well, man. You know better than that. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, you probably, by now, you have been hurt by someone. Somebody has broken your heart over and over. Or you, or you're the one breaking someone's heart. Let me tell you, stop that. Don't, don't awake love until it's time. Don't do that. God has a perfect time, man. But let me tell you, if, if you're like, dude, well, I, I, I'm done. I already did that. Then what? There's no hope for me? No. Thank God there is hope. There is always hope in Jesus. Let me take you to the book of Luke, chapter 7, verse 11. This is Jesus. It says, now, it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And this word Nain, the name of the city, means beautiful. And that's what God wants for you, beautiful life. It says, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd after him. When the, law, when the Lord saw her. You will know who this is. He had compassion on her and say to her, do not weep. This is a mother who had lost his child, his only son. She was a widow. And the only thing she had left was her boy. That was it. And the boy died. Imagine, like, try to picture yourself. You're an old woman, probably in your 50s, 60s, maybe. Your husband died a few years back, and all you have is your boy. And now, your boy's dead. That's it. That's the end of your name. No one else to continue your family history. No one else to, you know... Bring forward your name. That's it. This is the end of your story. No more Lopez. No more Trevino. No more Lozano. No more Cantu. Whatever is your last name. No more Alanis. That's it. Here it goes. This is the end of the road for you. And that's what the devil wants for you. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill your legacy. He wants to bring it to an end. And take away all the hope. But it says that Jesus saw her and had compassion. 
and says to the woman, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. There's another translation of the Bible that says that he grabbed hold of the coffin. He didn't touch it like, oh, you know, let me touch it. No, he grabbed hold of it. Strong. So much so that the bearers of the coffin had to stop because he was grabbing it that strong. So everybody stopped. And Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, arise. Another, verse of the, another version of the Bible says, Young man, I say to you, wake up. And just imagine everybody must be thinking like, what's wrong with this Jewish guy? What do you mean, wait, what, what is he doing talking to a dead boy? What do you mean, wake up? Let me tell you something. You cannot talk to a dead man. How many have been in a funeral? And you, and you talk to them. Like, wake up, man, don't go, whatever, right? But they don't listen to you. They're dead. But Jesus, man, not Jesus. If Jesus talks to you, you wake up. If Jesus talks to you, it doesn't matter if you're dead, you're going to wake up. Because there is power in his voice. There is power in him. Really, it's okay. If you today, if you're standing here dead in your sins, The voice of Jesus can wake you up, man. If you are so deep into your sin that you're, man, I'm lost. There's no hope for me. Jesus is talking to you today and saying, wake up. Wake up. There is hope, man. It's not lost. You don't have to throw the towel today. Jesus is telling you today, wake up. Wherever you are, wake up. And you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to wonder, but man, you, you don't know where I come from, man. You, know, you don't know what, what happened to me just last week. You have no clue, man. Let me tell you, Jesus has the power to raise you from the dead. It doesn't matter for how long you have been like that. You might be like, man, but it's been like years that I'm trapped in this cycle. I, I cannot get out of it. Today, today makes a difference. Today, Jesus says, arise, wake up. Today is the day. Verse 14 says, Then he came, touched the coffin, says, wake up. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. The dead boy woke up, sat up, and began to speak. And what was the first thing that dead boy saw? The most beautiful face ever. The face of Jesus. Not beautiful because of his looks. Beautiful, beautiful because of the love that he radiated. Beautiful because of the compassion he saw in the face of Jesus. So much love, so much compassion that he didn't care that he was dead. Anybody else will be, any doctor will be like, I'm sorry, ma'am, your boy, she's dead. There's nothing I can do, you know. That's life. Anybody else will be like, you know, man, I love Danny, you know, Danny, but, you know, he's dead, man. Like, he's, he's gone. We lost him. Don't even worry about him. Not Jesus, man. Jesus said, come back. I don't know. Where are you in your life today? All of you. You might be six feet under, spiritually talking. 
But Jesus cares. And not only he cares, he is the only one who has the power to say, dude, I have a new life for you. You were dead, that's all right. I am the life. And I give life. So Jesus present him to his mother. Imagine that ending. Where there was no hope, Jesus brought hope. Where there was death, Jesus brought life. Where there was weeping and mourning, now there is joy. That's the power of Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. To fulfill its loss. Forget about, man. Anything you're doing, forget about it. Cut it out. And put on the Lord Jesus. What are you waiting for? Put on the Lord Jesus. You don't need anything else, man. That's it. Cut it out. There is hope. What are you waiting for? There is a real enemy, and he's trying to get you dead. He's trying to erase your name from the book of life. He's trying to trick you. He's trying to tell you, man, it's okay. You don't need Jesus, man. It's all right. You're going to make it. You're a teenager, man. You, you get your life together when you're 30, man. Enjoy life right now. Go wild. Go crazy. Live life. Says who? Who says you have to go crazy to enjoy life? Man, it's about giving life, not taking life. And God is here to transform you. It is real, man. Again, I don't know where you're standing. I don't know how pure you are or not. I don't know how far have you gone or not. I don't know the things you do when you're by yourself. I don't know the things you look when nobody's watching. I don't know your thoughts. I have no clue what do you think when you see a girl or when you see a guy. But Jesus does. You know. And you might be thinking like, no, no, dude, but it was just one time and, it, you know, it's all right. I got it under control. No, you don't. That thing has control over you. And unless you surrender it to Jesus, it's going to eat you alive. And you think you have seen the worst thing? No, you haven't. But today is the day. When Jesus can transform you, when Jesus can bring you from death to life, today there is hope. If you don't like the life you have lived so far, let me tell you, it's okay. It's okay. Today, Jesus can take your old life and throw it away. And give you a brand new life. A life full of joy. A life full of peace. A life with a second chance. So all of this we're doing, man, it's not about information. It's about transformation. So I want to invite you today. To think... Where am I? Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop fooling myself. Really, where am I? Where am I today? Spiritually talking. In my sexuality, where am I standing? Am I asleep or I already woke up before time? Where are you? And second questions, where do you want to be? 
Again, Jesus is here. And he has a second chance for you. He has a new life. And I, I want to invite all of you to close your eyes right there where you are. The Bible says, make, make no provisions for the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Samson flirted with Delilah long enough to lose his strength and to give the secret of his heart. He thought he could handle it, but he ended up giving out the secret. And he traded what God had for him for the trap. So again, everybody with your eyes closed, let me ask you. Are you tired of living a lie? Are you tired of living unsatisfied? Are you tired of living brokenhearted? Are you tired of crying yourself to sleep every night? Are you tired of breaking your promise again and again, saying, I won't do it again? but you end up doing it again. If you're tired of the sin that has overpowered you, and if you're tired of living that life, and if you want to accept the new life that Jesus has for you, I want to ask you to put your hand up in the air. Today is the day of hope. Today, not tomorrow. Today your life can change completely. God is here. Jesus is here. And, and he wants to reach out to you and say, wake up. Arise. It doesn't matter if you're thinking that you're already six feet under. Jesus today says, wake up. Do you want to wake up? Again, if you want to wake up, lift up your hand. And put it high, as high as you can. Don't be embarrassed. Nobody's watching. Everybody has their eyes closed. Everybody, eyes closed. Let's pray this together. Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jesus. I woke up before time. But I know you have hope for me. I want to wake up. Jesus, I want that life that you have for me. I want a new life with you. Take away the old me and rise me up in you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Take control over me. Make me new. And guide me. And I will follow. Show me the way. And I'll be right behind you. Thank you for your love. 
thank you for your new life. I receive it in your name. Amen. Amen, guys.